Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to episode number 553 of this year electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. What have I got planned for you this week? Well, Stephen Latry from IMEC and I are talking all about SWIR, LIDAR, millimeter wave radar, sensor fusion, the growing need for architectural redefinition of computation hardware in autonomous driving, and a whole lot more. So get that seatbelt strapped on tight, my friends. We're driving to the future in the fast lane. Hi, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so at this year's ITF World, there was a presentation called Autonomous Driving, Automotive ADAS Needs Exceptional Perception and New Compute Paradigms. So first off, Stephen, let's talk about exceptional perception. What do you mean by that? And what are the biggest challenges to achieve that? Yeah. Yeah. So I think if you look at, at how the cars of the future are is going is evolving right now, I think it's clear that we're building really an, an HPC on wheels right now. There's all this talk about increasing the levels of autonomy for autonomous cars. But in order to do this, we really need to give them more eyes and ears probably as well to be able to really look 360 degrees around their surroundings. I think if you look at level two, two plus plus, so this is typically the, the type of driving car that we have right now. It has a number of sensors embedded with it, for example, like, like radar and cameras, but it's in a lot of cases, it doesn't suffice. And why doesn't it suffice, especially in those really adverse weather conditions, really in corner cases, we need more sensor modalities to make this work. So a LiDAR, SWIR, these type of sensors can actually help a lot in that as well. But what that means in reality is that you get an explosion on, in the number of data that this, these sensors are a, generating, but also an explosion in the number of data that you need for AI to really respond adequately to this perception as, a, as well. You're already seeing that in the last few years, just to give you a number, in the last few years we've been seeing an increase from yeah, 0 0.25 tops to 175 tops of the amount of compute that we need to put in a car and that only in um, in 12 years. And the expectation is that we will probably be requiring 1000 tops in the next five to 10 years as well, just to build the right type of AI to make sure that we have very intelligent cars in the future as well. That makes sense. Now, I was also really interested in another session at this year's ITF called Artificial Intelligence at IMEC from Power Efficient Edge Hardware to Large Scale AI Compute Frameworks. Now, Stephen, we are hearing a lot about AI these days, but I was really interested in how IMEC is using AI to encourage hardware software co design. So, first, tell me about how AI can assist with the co design of hardware and software and what techniques are key here. Well, I think it's a bit of the other way around. I think we really need hardware software co-design to be able to, to support AI in the future as, as well. So AI is, I think, a bit, is experiencing a bit the iPhone moment. I think um, with the release of ChatGPT, we have everybody right now who's really grasping the real potential of AI. Until recently, it was really quite vague of what you could do with a machine learning model. ChatGPT really changed this. Now everybody really grasps what this is about. I think the immediate reaction that probably everybody has, at least I had it, is actually I want this type of ChatGPT model just on my smartphone. I want it in my pocket to have it with me and every time I don't need any connectivity layer to a data center. I just wanted to have it in, in a very small device as well. The problem with this is that you need a 15-fold faster processor and probably a 170-fold bigger battery to run a model like GPT-3. And in GPT-4, it's just going to be much more as well. And so we need to have a kind of solution to be able to you know, run these type of big AI models in the future as well. So you could say, okay, let's just build bigger computers. But at the same time, AI is evolving as well. We're seeing a growth of the size of these neural network models with a factor 100 and more. So to give you an idea, if we move from GPT-3 to GPT-4, GPT-4 is actually a factor 10 
bigger than GPT-3, which was only released a year ago. And so you can do optimizations here and there, but the fact remains that the amount of computations that you have at a neural network are just constantly becoming bigger and bigger as well. So you need to have something to be able to make sure that these neural network models run faster on hardware, but you'll probably also need to change the software as well. And that's exactly what we mean with hardware software co-design. And we have some ideas on that where we think we can change both the hardware and the software at the same time to be able to let these neural networks run much faster as well. So in your talk, you mentioned that there is a need for architectural redefinition of computation hardware. Can you address that as well? Sure. Yeah, so if you look at this evolution of GPT, for example, but it actually is the same for all type of AI neural networks in the future, they run a kind of specific neural network architecture. And this is typically run with what we call the scaling hypothesis. So if you look at how these neural networks are under the hood, they are basically using large language models. And these large language models have a very specific architecture in terms of neural networks. Now the move from predecessors of GPT, so GPT-2 to GPT-3 to GPT-4, the way they address this right now is by just making these networks bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what I also meant with, well, the amount of computations is increasing exponentially in that. Now the issue with that is that if you want to get an accuracy increase on these type of neural networks, for example, from let's say 1%, so from 97%, to 98%, you actually need a factor of 1 million more operations to pull this off. And so what that means is that actually AI is hitting a roadblock. These networks are becoming bigger and bigger and bigger in terms of the amount of computations they need. We're looking at a factor 100 increase every year, but the hardware is not following suit. And so it's uh, Moore's law is saying a uh, factor two of improvement every two years, more or less while machine learning is, is expanding at a factor 100 in terms of computations per single year. So we need to solve this. And I think the way to solve this is by looking differently at the way these type of neural networks and specifically the, their architecture is, is running right now. So if you take the analogy of, of the human brain, I think the human brain is a very energy efficient device. If you look at it in terms of computing, it can perform the equivalent of an exaflop with just only 20 watts of power. If you compare that with, well, one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world, we're looking at the same type of performance, but it needs a million times more power being 20 megawatts. So despite how good ChatGPT is right now, there must be something that our human brain is doing much better than we are doing at the level of machine learning. And so we've essentially built software and hardware at the same time that is mimicking the human brain and it's getting extremely close to it. But we've done that in such an inefficient way that I think it will not scale. I think you can compare it a little bit to the first flight of an airplane when the, the Wright brothers flew their plane. They only were able to do it for a, a few feet probably. I think at machine learning, we're probably at the same level right now. We're able to demonstrate that we can get really high in levels of intelligence, but we're doing it in an extremely inefficient way. So I think we need to move, uh, taking the same analogy from that plane of only a few feet towards flying thousands of miles. And I think that's the journey of how AI is ahead of us right now. And so how does that mean in terms of architecture then? Well, so the answer is as I said already at the beginning, it's hardware software co-design. So the answer is not in the software, it's not in the hardware. It's really in the combination of both. I think you have, you'll have huge workloads of the future that are going to be AI focused. Um, this has the advantage that the type of traffic being machine learning traffic is going to be quite homogeneous and predictable because you're just pushing data through very large neural networks. But at the same time, we're, we're still doing this with compute technology, which actually predates the area of AI. We're using CPUs and GPUs, which are not designed with AI in mind. So we need to, you can make some optimizations, but we really need to have a fundamental breakthrough for this. And so that means that you need to change both the software architecture. So how does that neural network is actually being represented? And you need to change the hardware architecture as well. And that's the two things together that we think that we can really make an impact on. So I'll give you a few examples of this just to make it a bit more concrete. I think in, in terms of the hardware, 
how this works. I think we have some ideas of how we think we could build better hardware that supports machine learning in the future. I'll just give you a few areas that we're working on. On the one hand, we're working on uh, superconducting or, or cryogenic computing. The idea is to take advantage of near zero electrical resistance of materials at very low, so ultra low temperatures. And that actually allows us to build computers which would support exaflops with only tens of watts but at the size of, of a shoebox. You could also think of building in-memory computing systems, which that means that instead of pushing data from a memory system to a logic component, that you do the calculations actually in the memory as well, very similar to how the human brain works. So these two examples are fundamental differences in how we change the compute hardware and compute architecture as well. It's not only the hardware, it's also the software that you need to change. The scaling hypothesis has actually shown us that there are multiple ways of building neural networks, but in reality, the biggest gains that you get is by just building those networks bigger and bigger as well. And so we believe that you can actually do something in software which might be suboptimal, but if you know that you're working with a specific hardware in mind, you could probably have a much better software implementation specifically tuned to that hardware as well. So that's what we mean with the architecture change and it's architecture at different levels. It's architecture at the hardware level and it's architecture at the software level as well, because that's really our biggest belief. You need to combine both hardware and software at the same time to really make a huge impact and performance improvement that we need for machine learning. That makes sense. Now, Stephen, we also need to take a closer look at integration paradigms, packaging and standardization here too, right? Absolutely. I think if you want to make a change on this, we really need to go full stack in all of this. So I've, what I've seen in the machine learning world altogether, I myself, I'm coming from a computer science background, and I've been seeing how these different fields have evolved really very independently of, of each other. So as I already said, AI is probably going to be the biggest workload of the future. And in order to pull this off, I think we need to make dedicated accelerators, dedicated hardware to do this. But it's not just at the, at the device level, you need to look at it from the circuit level, the packaging level, you need to go all the way really up to the software level as well. And I think also their standardization is going to be crucial. There are already de facto software suites or de facto standard software suites as well. You can build the best and the brightest hardware technology in the world if it's not catered for um, the software data scientist world either. So it's not using the same level of tools that they are using right now, it's probably also not gonna get the breakthrough that you're hoping for. So it's really a, a call for arms at the, for full stack integration of all of these different layers. I think that's the only way that you're really going to make a dent in the machine learning world. All right, Stephen, before I let you go, it's time for your off the cuff question. Since you haven't been on my show before, you get my standard off the cuff. Okay, so Stephen, if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, or the restaurant is closed, what would you have? Well, I think I'm going to go for that option of uh, the other side of the world. I'm really a sucker for pineapple, and I know that the best pineapple can actually be found in Hawaii. Every time I visited Hawaii already twice, and I think pineapple from Hawaii is, is the best that you can have. So I will definitely go for just simple pineapple, but really from Hawaii, really fresh and all. Maybe a fun fact also related to AI on that. A few days ago, I asked ChatGPT whether it was allowed to put pineapple on a pizza, and he definitely recommended it to me. Now, I really love pineapple, but I would never want to have it on my pizza. So I think we still have a long way ahead of us for really human intelligence as, a, as well. I love that. That is great, Stephen. And uh, yes, pineapple from Hawaii is absolutely a perfect food. <laughs> well, Stephen, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks a lot. It was a great time. If you're interested in hearing more information about ITF World, I would encourage you to listen to my recent interview with Joe DeBoke from IMEC as well. And you can check out this interview, as well as other links about IMEC and ITF World, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page on eejournal.com, or by checking out this week's episode on YouTube as well. 
Hey, have you seen EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should check us out. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter or X, as the case may be, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have that YouTube channel I just mentioned, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of October 13th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton and you've been fried. <laughs>